thanks very much. And thanks very much for that introduction, Stephen. I'm, I'm sure you're not always so dishonest. <laughs> um, it's great to be here, and thank you all for coming. It's, uh, it's great to be part of such a distinguished series, and I'm sorry to bring it down uh, to such a level. But anyway, I'm going to talk today about uh, something that's always bothered me. Uh, I am what's known as a corrective justice theorist. Now, what, what does that mean? Well, what I take it to mean is that I believe that corrective justice provides the best account of tort law possible. Now, um, the problem... Is this okay? I'm just going to be echoing. Is it, is it all right? Can you all hear me all right? I'm not, okay, I'm just getting this feedback in my own head. It's okay. It's fine. I'll adjust. Okay, so I, I believe that corrective justice provides the best theory of tort law possible. But there are people who'll tell people I respect who will tell you that if you look at the way that tort law actually works, if you look at the system in operation, you'll see that it doesn't work in the way that corrective justice suggests that it will work. <clears throat> if you focus entirely on the courts, maybe it works that way. But if you look at the way the tort law system actually works, you'll see that it doesn't work that way. Now, I've always thought that there were very good arguments, very good responses to this objection. I don't think I've produced some. Uh, but I've always been a little bit uncomfortable about these responses. And that's now, I realise, because I should have been a bit uncomfortable about the responses. And part of the point of this lecture is to talk about why that is. Why there is, I think, more to these problems than, at least in the past, I've thought there has been. Now, to do this, I need to make a distinction between two things that are related but different. And this is what I call tort law and the tort system. These are just convenient terms, so I'm going to define them as follows. So tort law is, <coughs> excuse me, T tort law denotes a specific area of the law. It refers to the rules and principles that constitute the doctrines of that area of the law. So it includes things like the neighbour principle in the law of negligence, the defence of qualified privilege and defamation, the rule that the apprehension of imminent battery is an assault and so on. Okay, stuff you learn in courses on tort law at university, in introductory tort courses at university. The tort system, on the other hand, refers to the institution that tort law partly creates as that institution exists in society. So the tort system includes tort law, but is not so confined. In studying the tort system, you might examine, for example, the consequences of tort law as they relate to the efficiency and cost of the judicial system, or what is more common, you might examine tort law's effectiveness in providing a, a system of compensation for incapacity. That was a, not, it's not so much studied anymore, but that was a huge topic in the 60s and 70s. How good is tort law actually at providing compensation for people? Okay, now I, I want to argue that both of these, that is both tort law and the tort system, are important objects of study, and that they are separate objects of study, uh, but they shine a really interesting light on each other. <clears throat> Okay, so I'm going to start with tort law. Uh, the first half of the talk is about tort law, and I'm, in this part of the talk I'm going to defend the theory of tort law, or our theory of tort law. Specifically, I'm going to talk about corrective justice theory, but it could be any theory that focuses on tort law itself, rather than on the tort system. Okay, what's the problem? supposed to be? What's the problem with theories like corrective justice theory supposed to be? Well, here are some, I'm not very big on PowerPoints, but I, I thought I would, instead of just reading out the quotes that I'm going to read to you today, we'll, we'll stick them up on here so that at least it may be easier to follow. So Tom Baker, in this article that we're going to spend quite a bit of time talking about in the second half of the talk, says, tort law in practice is only a tenuous link with the corrective justice theories propounded by legal theorists. This, this is basically the essential claim. You see it's all over the place again and again and again and again. Okay, tort law in practice, in practice, the way it actually works, uh, it has only a tenuous link with the corrective justice theories propounded by, propounded by legal theorists. Okay, now what's the content of that? Well, why, why is that? Well, here's another quote from, this time from uh, David Campbell, who, uh, despite being uh, a serious critic of this view, is actually one of my best friends. Um, it, it, and Dave, Dave says, the success of the philosophy of corrective justice has turned the disregard of how the personal injury system actually functions that has long characterised abstract tort jurisprudence almost into a principle. 
The undermining of that philosophy which would seem to follow from showing yet again that the personal injury system normally does not, because it cannot affect the positive correction, is avoided in the theory of civil recourses claim that the possibility of bringing a tort action is a redress mechanism that can be justified because its mere availability <coughs> enhances social solidarity. Okay, now many specific complaints can be extracted from these remarks, but I think the key, for us anyway today, the key claim is this one. No theory of tort law that ignores the tort system can be adequate. That, that's the central claim. So we've all been focusing on what goes on in the courts, we've all been focusing on legal doctrine, but the claim is we can't do that, we can't get away with that. We have to look at how it actually works in practice uh, in the wider world. <coughs> So, and when one adds to this the fact, and we'll see later that it is a fact, that leading theorists of tort law make claims that are inconsistent with the tort system. So, there are claims that we make that are inconsistent with the tort system. The conclusion appears to follow that we provide inadequate accounts of tort law. Okay, but my question is, why should one accept the premise of this argument? Like, why think that studying tort law has got anything to do with studying the tort system. The answer that I think these guys would give is that tort law is a tool for realizing certain social goals. And because of this, because tort law is a tool for realizing certain social goals, facts about the tort system are the key to understanding tort law because those goals are achieved through the operation of that system. So according to this view, this view that's really dominated the way we think about tort law for about 100 years now, uh, the idea that tort law might be studied for its own sake, that is not for its effects, but studied for its own sake, appears to be at least strangely myopic. Now in order to spell out this position, to explain it, I, I want to talk about the nature of tools for a bit. I'm going to talk about hammers. I guess because it reminds me of an under undergraduate studying Martin Heidegger. I'm going to talk about hammer. And I actually thought I should bring a hammer. I was going to bring a hammer. I thought, that's a bloody stupid bringing a hammer all the way from New Zealand to Canada. So I guess <laughs> hold it. But, but anyway, so you've got to imagine. Imagine that I'm holding a hammer. I'm, I've, got, I've got a hammer here. But, and, and there's a, you know, it's got a wooden handle, this hammer. Okay, for reasons that you'll see in a minute why it's significant that it has a wooden, hammer, a wooden handle. Okay, so imagine that I'm, I'm looking at this hammer, right, and I, I'm studying it, I'm studying it, I'm studying the shape of its head, you know, it's got this sort of black, shiny head, and it's hard, and it's got this claw, and then I start paying attention to this rather wonderful pattern of the grain, of the wood, of the handle of the hammer. Okay, now if I do this, you might say that the focus this way on the hammer, particularly to, to look at the grain of the wood and the, 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 the handle of the hammer, is to miss its essence as a hammer. Okay, a hammer is a tool, and understanding the object that it is requires understanding the purposes for which it is used. And once you approach the hammer from this perspective, you'll see that certain things are important and certain things are unimportant. So yeah, the shape of the head of the hammer, that's important because it relates to the purpose of driving in nails. The shape of the claw of the hammer, that's important because it relates to the purpose of pulling out nails. But the precise pattern of wood in the handle of the hammer, that's unimportant. That's insignificant. Okay, so to focus on the grain of the wood is to miss the hammer's essence as the tool that it is. Okay, so on this approach, to truly comprehend the hammer for the object that it is as a tool, we've got to first understand the purpose for which it is used. And then we're able to recognize the role that the properties of the hammer play in realizing that purpose. And so from this point of view, it would be bizarre for someone to insist that they'll examine a hammer without saying anything about banging in nails. Right? That would just be a really bizarre thing to do. So imagine that I, would, I, write, a, I write a book called The Hammer. Right? And it's, you know, this book is like my first book, 580 pages long. <coughs> on the hammer. And nowhere in this book do I say anything about driving in nails. Right? And you get you get to page 580 and you think, what the hell is this guy on about? Right? I, I've read this whole book, this huge massive tome about hammers, and he's never said anything about banging in nails. Right? This guy's an idiot. Well, that's the response that these people have when they read my books. <laughs> because this is what I seem to be to them to be doing. Right? I write this whole book about tort law, and I don't say anything about the 
purposes for which tort law is to be used, the social purposes and so on, and I don't try to interpret tort law in the light of those social purposes. It's as if I'm writing about hammers without saying anything about banging and nails. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So that's the attack. That, excuse me. <laughs> I'm going to explode in this. <laughs> that's sort of like an intellectual version of Mr. Krebs. So, oh, that's all for your time. Um, um, anyway, um, so that's the attack. That's what, that's what these guys are. That's what these, why these guys think we're kind of out to lunch. What's, what's the response? Okay. So the first thing I'd say is it's important not to exaggerate in any context the significance of the point of view that's just been examined. An instrumental analysis of an object is never solely the correct one. So that's, that, while it's true, so here, here I have my imaginary hammer again, uh, while it's true that if I'm, as I'm paying attention to the pattern of the grain on the handle, I'm not comprehending the hammer as the tool that it is, but nevertheless it would be wrong to say I'm not learning something true about the hammer. But I am learning something true about the hammer. It does have this pattern of grain. And as I study the pattern of grain on the hammer, I'm learning something that's true about the hammer. Sure, it doesn't relate to the hammer's purposes, but it's nevertheless true. That hammer does have that pattern of grain on the handle. So, though the grain of the, uh, of the hammer's handle is unimportant to the hammer as a tool, right, nevertheless you discover something about the hammer when you study it. So, truth is revealed about objects, even tools. Truth is revealed about tools, even tools, when you study the tools for their own sake. When you study a tool for its own sake, not as a tool, but for its own sake, you discover something true about it. And there seems to be no reason to think that law would be any different, even if law were a tool. Okay, now one, let's think about that. Is it right to think about law as a tool? Why, why might it be right to think about that? Well, I think the answer again would be, well, because law has important social functions to play. We should think of it as a tool because it has important social functions. Uh, however, a great many objects that have important social functions, are, they are valuable for what they produce, aren't tools. And we don't think of them as tools. And there are many examples you can think of, I suppose, but my favourite example is always to think about works of art in this context. We value works of art because of well, let's just say, because they enrich our lives and the pleasure that they bring, whatever, right? We value works of art because of the effects that they have. Uh, if they didn't have these effects, we wouldn't make them or bother attending to them. And if I didn't get any pleasure from reading a book, I wouldn't, from reading books, I wouldn't read books. Right? Um, so we value these things for the effects that they have. But understanding them, comprehending them, is not a matter of understanding those effects. So Hamlet for example, is, I believe, studied in schools throughout the English-speaking world. But when we study Hamlet, when you study Hamlet at school, you're not focused on the effects of viewing or reading the play. Now, that's not what the study was about. Now, typical questions concerning Hamlet would include things like, well, why does, why does Hamlet take so long? In, you know, why does he muck around so much in avenging his father's death? And, uh, and so on. We ask these kinds of questions. These aren't questions about how the audience is feeling. right? These aren't questions about the impact of watching Hamlet on the life of the viewer. These are questions about the play itself. Right? We focus on Hamlet by taking the play as something of value for its own sake, even though right, it has important social purposes. So asking these questions is part of an attempt to understand Hamlet for its own sake. And Hamlet, so Hamlet is valuable for the pleasure that it produces, but our normal focus on Hamlet is not on that pleasure, but on the work for its own sake. And nobody thinks that there's anything odd about that. Right? Um, there are no Hamlet realists out there that are lambasting us all for being Hamlet formalists. Right? We don't think there's anything odd about that in this context. Yes, of course we focus on Hamlet for its own sake, even though it's valuable for the pleasure that it produces. No, what's, the, what's the problem? Well, why, why should there be any problem with doing the same thing in law? Now, what is it that makes an object such as Hamlet reward study for its own sake? Uh, the answer is a long one, but part of the story is that, well, part of the answer, is that Hamlet is self-reflexive in the sense that it's supposed to be understood as a whole. So you couldn't understand the work if you held the view, for example, that Hamlet's stabbing of Polonius was, an, an, you know, oh, it's just a freak event. You know, so why did Hamlet stab Polonius? Oh, I don't know, just got a bit hacked off. 
But that, that's, if you approach the work that way, you won't understand it. You've got to try and understand it as a whole. You see it as related to the revelation, somehow, right? You've got to work that out. It's somehow related to the revelations of Hamlet's father's ghost. But the play is meant to make sense as a unit. And to put this another way, Hamlet rewards study for its own sake because uh, it tells a story. And part of the point of studying Hamlet for its own sake is to work out what that story is. Now, in this regard, the law, especially the common law, seems to me much more closely resembles a play or a novel than a tool or than a hammer. Uh, a judgment, a judgment of a court, is not an isolated instance of adjudication. It's not like, oh, why did the judge do that? Oh, it just, just felt, the vocal and felt like doing it. That's not the story, right? Uh, it's rather a statement. A judgment is a statement that's meant to say something in the context of an already existing body of law. So in the simplest case, a judgment may be nothing more than an application of existing law, but it may extend the existing law to cover new area, it may criticise the existing law, it may do all sorts of other things. But the point is that the common law is self-reflexive in the way that a story is. And Ronald Dworkin has tried to capture this notion by saying that the common law is like a chain novel. So a chain novel is, you know, I, I write one chapter and then I give it to you and you write the next chapter. <coughs> Someone else brought some extra. What everyone thinks about Ronald Dawkins' theory in general, it seems to me that this is really, really onto something here. Uh, when judges write the next chapter in the history of the law, they're not writing it as if it was a new, not a new novel starting from scratch. They write it uh, as the next chapter in a long chain, in a long chain novel. So the judgment is supposed to tell a story about the law. And that can be understood as part of, that can only be understood, that judgment can only be understood as part of the wider story that is the law. But, and what we're trying to do when we understand law is try to understand what that story is. But, and we can only do that by focusing on the law for its own sake. If we, if we turn our attention to the, the effects of law in society, we won't, we, we won't understand the story of the law any more than if we try and understand, than trying to understand Hamlet. Uh, by, you know, I don't know, doing MRI scans on people in the audience. <clears throat> okay, so if to the functionalists, if to these guys, the formalist like me appears to be trying to understand hammers without taking into account the fact that they used to drive in nails, so uh, we seem mad to them. Uh, to the formalist, to, to me, these guys seem to be trying to understand the story of Hamlet by examining the effects of the play on the audience. And we both seem mad to each other. And that's a bit of a sorry state of affairs. And I should say it really is like this. I mean, do people write, I mean, or maybe you've come across this, people write textbooks where they talk about, for example, the taught wars. Right? And this is not just some kind of metaphor, you know, the taught wars, ha ha. No, no, people really get worked up about this and dislike each other right, uh, over this stuff. Um, now, and there are, there are a few exceptions to this, not many, but a few exceptions of people who are genuinely interested. Right, in the ideas of the opposing camp. You'd like to think that academia would be full of this, but it actually isn't. Uh, there are only very few people who have the generosity to be interested in ideas of the people from the opposing camp. And actually, the, the leading, our leading example of this, anyway, that I know of is sitting over here, Jason Nayers, who's one of the, in my view, is one of the most generous academics uh, that I've ever, well, probably the most generous academic that I've ever met. I wish more academics were like him, I wish I was more like them <laughs> in this regard. This is all my way of saying thank you for inviting, for inviting. But I, but that, but that isn't BS. I mean, that. okay. Now, um, naturally, there may, there are many disanalogies between uh, artworks and law, and many analogies between law and tools. Um, I've defended the notion that law can usefully be understood for its own sake from the attacks, but I haven't shown that it can actually usefully be studied for its own sake. I don't think there's any way to settle that question a priori. The only thing to do is to get busy and do the work and see what you come up with. Right? Try studying it for its own sake and see what you come up with. If you come up with something useful, great. If you don't, well, okay, it hasn't worked. Try and study it from the functionalist perspective and see what you come up with. If what you come up with is useful, great. If it's not, not. Um, so you, you can't settle this. But people always try and settle this in a sort of 10,000 word article. You can't settle this in a 10,000 word You can settle this in a 10 year research project maybe. But, but you can't settle it just by some uh, uh, argument just like that. Right? You've got to look and see. This is you need to work. Um, um, so one can only compare the success of theories that study law for its own sake with those that study law as a tool. 
Now, oh, right. uh, once this is realised, however, I, I submit that though we don't have a clear winner, maybe, we, just, we do have a clear leader between the modern mainstream functionalist analysis, analysis of tort law and the corrective justice theory. As I mentioned earlier, the modern mainstream functionist analysis has dominated the academy, dominated our way of thinking about law for about a century. And I think we just have to ask ourselves, over this period of time, has our understanding of the law become clearer? Uh, do we have a firmer grip on it than we had 100 years ago? Right? Have problems been resolved? Right? Do, we, do we now go, oh, they didn't understand anything 100 years ago, now we know. Right? If you go back 100 years, it looks as if they knew pretty much what they were doing and we have no idea. Uh, we're completely lost in a way that people 100 years ago were not lost. Um, so, and I think this is actually widely accepted. If you pick up taught textbooks, you'll find even people who defend the modern view saying that the modern view doesn't really make any sense. And I, I, I must admit, I find that really kind of odd. And there's a lot of what, I, what seems to me to be defense of the indefensible uh, in modern taught scholarship, where you say, oh God, these corrective justice guys, no, we don't want them. Right? We, don't want, we don't want them infiltrating us. No, we'll stick with the status quo. But yeah, the status quo is pretty crap, actually. <laughs> I mean, well, if it's pretty crap, actually, maybe we should look for something else. Anyway, so it seems to me a little bit odd. But anyway, my claim is that though tort law has important social effects, and though it's important to study those effects, tort law can nevertheless be profitably studied for, its, for itself. And there seems to be nothing even remotely odd about that, I think, once the modern confusions have been removed. You can profitably study legal doctrine for its own sake, and you learn about the law when you do this. But Campbell has argued that this won't work. Ah, no, 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 there's one more. Okay, he, he said, if it's claimed that moral wrongdoing is ultimately identified by the views of the common citizens, of common citizens, then this is to ignore the shaping of tort liability by the institutional structure of the personal injury system. The identification of a solvent tort visa is essential to the claims process and in a system dominated by liability insurance, as the personal injury system ultimately is bound to be, unless insurance against negligence is forbidden, which would itself lead to the disappearance of the system, the incidence of solvency is largely a function of the market conduct of the insurer. Okay, there's more than one claim here. This, again, this is very common. The key claim here is very common. It's that tort law has been, and really we're talking about the law of negligence more than anything else here. Negligence has been shaped by insurance. And so it's impossible to understand the law of negligence uh, without that fact in mind. Okay? So you've got, to, you've got to look away, if you want to understand negligence law, you've got to look away from <coughs> the doctrines and you've got to pay attention to these external factors, most importantly insurance. Now, the question is, there's no doubt that insurance has been extremely important in the development of the law. Uh, but does the argument actually work? Now, without more, and we'll see in a moment, you can actually say more, but without more, the argument's just a straight non sequitur. So e even if it's true that the law of negligence could not have developed as it has developed without the availability of insurance, it just doesn't follow that you can't understand uh, the law without taking that fact into account. It, this argument commits what is known as a genetic fallacy. And let me just give you another example of the, uh, uh, to reveal this. So, so I'm told, I hardly claim to be an expert on this, but so I'm told the development of the mobile phone was made possible only by quantum mechanics. If it wasn't for quantum mechanics, we wouldn't have mobile phones. But thankfully, you can use your mobile phone without understanding modern physics. It wouldn't be very useful. Well, actually, it wouldn't be useful to anyone uh, because no one understands modern physics, at least of all the physicists. That, that, they'll, they'll, they'll tell you that, right? I mean, that's not, that's not abuse for me. Right? That's, that's, it's not understandable, right? Um, so, so you don't need to understand how the origin of something in order to understand what it is. And um, there's no reason to think that one must understand the social conditions that made the rules and doctrines of tort law possible to comprehend those rules and doctrines. Now, it, now, of course, we might want to understand negligence law historically, right? and if we want to understand it historically, then yeah, we're going to have to pay attention to insurance. But we, why do we need to understand it historically? Maybe we can just understand it for the thing that it, that it is, but not for how it was created. Likewise, if it turns out that we discover that Shakespeare wrote Hamlet because he had a Danish cousin that he, was, he wanted to annoy, right? 
And that would be interesting, right? But it wouldn't necessarily affect our understanding about what the story of Hamlet is. Okay, so, and it's important to recognize that the corrective justice, although this is, this is really commonly misunderstood, the corrective justice theorist is not committed to the view that the extent positive law is a perfect <coughs> instantiation of her theory. On the contrary, it's very frequently the case that what motivates, certainly with my case, what motivates me to write is when I discover that the law is not in congruence with my view about the way it ought to be. That's what motivates me. So I wouldn't have written anything, right, if I thought that the law was a perfect fit for my theory. I just wouldn't have bothered getting out of bed. I have to be angry about something, to, you know, to want to write about it, doesn't it? <clears throat> okay, um, now, um, so, so the corrective justice theorist is not forced to deny the, the influence of external concerns on the positive law or to turn a blind eye to these things. She merely regards the rules that result from that external influence as distortions. Okay, but you might ask, and I think this is the question that, that Dave Campbell would want us to ask, how much distortion can a system sustain before it's no longer the system that it was? So the, the allegation then is, whatever tort law might once have been, or whatever it might have become, today's tort law is so distorted by external factors like insurance that it can't be understood in the absence of those factors. But again, that seems to me to be, it's not something that could be true a priori. Whether it is true or not is a matter for investigation. All you can do is try and examine the law without taking insurance into account and see what you come up with. If you come up with something that can't explain the law, well, okay, maybe you're going to have to take insurance into account. So you've got to get busy and do the work, see, see what you come up with. Okay, now, my own view is that the evidence suggests that tort law's liability doctrines, the liability doctrines, though somewhat distorted, are not so distorted as to prevent a clear system of of uh, liability from emerging. And I've written some, you know, three books about that, so I must think it's true, right? And I, did, I got busy and did the work, and right, for all the faults of those books, at least I, I convinced myself right, that there's enough coherence within tort law's liability doctrines that we can say that they form a system. But I think things are different when we turn to the law's remedies. And it's here, after all, that the critics have really concentrated their energies. Now, in order to reveal what the issue is here, I just want to talk about this um, passage. I think it's probably actually come out now, this, this article. Uh, Christopher Esser from U of T, and he's talking about the theories of Ernie Weiner and um, Arthur Ripstein. Uh, and this is, just, and this is just a summary. But there's a, a really crucial ambiguity in this summary that I, I want to bring out. So he says, they, so that's Ernie and Arthur, that they see private law as playing a special role in the realization of just relations between free and equal moral persons. At an abstract level, they see such relations as being governed by the overarching abstract idea that no person is naturally in charge of any other, which they take to be a characterization of the idea that persons are free and equal. Okay, perfectly fair summary. But here's the question. What's been said here is the claim that the doctrines of private law are best understood in the light of the notion that they are attempts to realize just relations between free and equal moral persons. Is that the idea? Or is the claim that private law actually achieves these relations so that people in our societies actually are free and equal in the relevant way? Right? So the question is, is this just a claim about, so if we talk about just specifically tort law rather than private law in general, is this a claim about tort law or about the tort system? Are we saying that tort law's doctrines are a, a, an attempt to achieve this kind of justice? That's how we should understand those doctrines. Right? They are an attempt to achieve those just relations. Or are we saying that we've actually succeeded in our societies in achieving this through tort law? Right? <clears throat> Which is it? Now, this is important because it seems to me that if the claim is about the tort system, then it's false. Okay. If the claim is that we've actually achieved this kind of justice in our societies, we have and the claims are wrong. Now, Arthur Ripstein's book, Private Wrongs, is a great book, and I, I, don't, I don't want to come across as saying anything else. It's a really, really, really good book. Uh, it's a most significant <laughs> contribution to the study of tort law. The eighth and ninth chapters of the book talk about remedies, and they defend the common sense notion that tort law's responses are genuinely remedial 
against the list of well-known objections to that view. And the discussion, this discussion operates against natural seeming assumptions about the way that tort law functions. Just to give you an example of this. So it, 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 it says if someone takes your means, the way to correct the wrong is by giving them back. The means no longer exist, and in order for you to be given what is yours, you need to receive equivalent means. I probably can't put your vase back together again, and even if I could, the most I could give you is a repaired vase, not an attack one. Your right is to have the means you had a right to all along. I, don't, I won't go through the rest of the so the, the standard idea, right? You've broken something, you've got to, you've got to uh, compensate um, to give the per person back the means that they had that they've lost as a result of your negligence. Okay, now, the, this analysis, in common with the objections to which it responds, takes for granted a picture according to which injured plaintiffs utilise tort law to seek and receive full compensation for injuries from the person who caused those injuries. The problem is, it doesn't happen. That's a picture of a largely imaginary world. Ripstein and his combatants are fighting over the correct conceptual understanding of a world that doesn't exist. Now again, I, I actually think it's worth doing that. It's worth trying to work out what the concepts entail. But the mistake is thinking that this tells us anything about the world in which we actually live. Now, I don't want to go through in any great depth the arguments for, these, for that conclusion. There are six main points, I think, that I'll just go through quickly. Although the, the data that I've got relates specifically to the United Kingdom. I, it can't be very different anywhere else in the common law world. But, but anyway, here we go. What are the main points? The first point is that litigation generally occurs only when the defendant is insured, regardless of the strength of the plaintiff's position as a matter of law. So even if you're clear you're going to win, if the defendant's not insured, you just won't bother. And, what's more, the damages are paid by the insurer. And we're going to look in a bit of detail about why this is. It's not quite the reason that you might think why the damages are normally paid by the insurer. The second, is that social, the second point is that social welfare, in fact, in fact plays a far more important role than tort law in compensating victims of torts. We tend to think that insurance is the big factor, but it, it turns out that social welfare has been extremely important uh, in, in shaping this area of the law as well. And another reason for that, the third point, is that welfare plays a really important indirect role in funding tort litigation, <coughs> so that those who don't receive welfare support are highly unlikely to receive any compensation through the law. So we don't provide welfare support for people so that they can sue. Right? But the point is that if you don't if you get injured and you don't receive welfare support, you're unlikely to be able to afford right, to even think about bringing a tort claim. So uh, the welfare system plays a very important indirect role in funding tort litigation. The, the fourth point is that the overwhelming proportion of tort damages are paid by insurance companies. The figure is 94% in the UK. 94% no, of tort damages are paid by insurance companies. And almost all the rest of it is paid by bodies that are self-insured. So they're paid by corporations and so forth that, that are self-insured. Um, meaning that the actual individual tort fees are hardly ever pays tort damages. The fifth point is that potential plaintiffs are normally determined to settle rather than pursue claims for the courts, even if that means that they receive significant undercompensation. No, they'd rather get something and not go to court than go to court but, and get more. And the last point is that most tort payments are in fact, this really surprised me, most tort payments are in fact for minor injuries, and so tort law plays only a very insignificant role in providing compensation for major injury, and that falls back on social welfare and voluntary work. <clears throat> okay, now the claim here, I really want to stress this, the claim here is not that tort theorists can't respond to these problems. But tort theorists can respond to these problems if their aim is to defend their theory as a theory of tort law. But the problem is that if, tort, if the tort lawyer, if the tort theorist gives the impression that the world is the way that their theory suggests that it would be, then we have a problem. So as we've seen, much of the theory of damages proceeds on the basis that a wrongdoing defendant actually makes good the wrong by paying uh, the, uh, uh, the plaintiff. But in fact, there are the It's very, very rare. Um, so, in short, if tort theory remains about tort law, as it often does, then it's immune to these criticisms. But if it spills over to make claims about the tort system, as it sometimes does, then it's vulnerable to the criticisms, as the claims are often demonstrably false. Now, for our purposes, the most important work is, in this regard is done by this guy Tom Baker, who we met earlier, 
who studied the operation of the tort system in Connecticut and Florida. And his central observation is that personal injury lawyers in those jurisdictions, both from the defendants and the plaintiffs bar, make a clear distinction between what they call blood money and insurance money. Now, insurance money is obviously enough the money that an insurance company would pay. Blood money is the money that an actual defendant would pay, so if we're talking about the defendant as a, as a natural person. Now that's, they call this blood money. And the fact that they call it blood money tells you something about their attitude towards it. They think there's something wrong with it. Right? Going after blood money is wrong. Okay, so um, the, and we, we really need to focus on this because it's, it's a point of real importance for us. The, the payment of damages by the defendant to the plaintiff as a response to the defendant's wrongful injuring of, of the plaintiff is treated by tort theorists not only as ordinary and unremarkable, but as the paradigm example of the tort system in operation. Like, so, I injure you, I have to pay you. We, we tort theorists regard that's the paradigm example of the tort system in operation. Oh, maybe I should say tort law in operation. Now, it's in this payment, we say, that you see most clearly the justice of the law in operation. The defendant has to correct, like in this, my example, I have to correct my wrong to you by compensating you. Thus the payment of damages is thought to be the archetypal case. Right? The payment of damages by the defendant to the plaintiff is the archetypal case upon which all other kinds of payments are parasitic. But it's utterly remarkable then that the same payment is in fact highly unusual. And that it's highly unusual in part because it's regarded by practitioners of the tort system as seriously iniquitous. It's not just that they don't go after it, they think it's wrong to go after it. Okay, so we think that this is the paradigm example of justice in action. The practitioners think it's too unjust to be contemplated. But why is this? Well, here, here are some quotes. But one of the things that... Well, okay, so here, here's a quote from Baker, and then we'll have a look at some of the interviews. So insurance money is something that all personal injury lawyers talk about. Uh, imagine they don't talk about much else. But blood money is a hidden subject that lawyers have to be pressed to talk about. It's a, it's a secret. It's a dirty secret. Uh, when they do, most plaintiff's lawyers claim that they try not to go after blood money, and most defence lawyers back that claim up. Now, what, what Baker did is he conducted interviews with people, and here are some extracts from the interviews. Uh, we, we don't do it often, go after blood money, and if you talk to every res responsible plaintiff's lawyer in the state, I bet it's rare. It's irresponsible to go after plaintiff's, uh, to go after blood money. But, I mean, there's what we used to call an unwritten union rule, that you take the insurance coverage and you go home. It really doesn't happen too often. Guys will call and say, this is from, from a defence lawyer. Guys will call and say, what's the insurance policy? And that's it. And they go away. But we do have situations where they go out and put an attachment on the house. Not too often. It's almost like an unwritten code of lawyers that you don't go after those. <laughs> but there's no rule on that. It's just been something that I was think I was taught, I think that, that I think I was taught by my bosses, and you see it among the plaintiffs' lawyers. Okay. But Baker even documents that he was told by a plaintiff that plaintiff's lawyers will refuse to represent clients who insist on blood money. So if you go and say, I want that guy to pay, they'll say, no, okay, let's find someone else. I'm not going to do it. Okay, he tells another story of a defence lawyer who had a friend who sought blood money from one of his clients. And this was his response. So I love this. So, so he, he hears, he, he's, it's his mate, right? It's his friend who's, who's, who he used to work with, who's gone to work for, for himself. And he, he finds, he's, he's now representing a plaintiff, and he finds out, hey, this guy's going to sue my client for blood money. So he rings the guy up, and he says, yeah, so first I thought it was a mistake, and I called him, and I said, John, what, are you kidding? 50 is 50 is 50 is 50. That's the policy, the insurance policy. You only get half the, half the compensation that you, strictly speaking, entitled to. That's all we've got. Take it and go away. And apparently, since he was out studying his own law firm, he had made a deal with the referring attorney that he would try the case. But he didn't get a fee unless he'd gone over the offer. So the offer had been 50. So my guy had to end up paying, that's my, my guy now is the, his, his client, the plaintiff. Uh, sorry, the defendant. So my guy had to end, he ended up paying another 15,000 out of his own pocket to settle this case. And I've never spoken to the lawyer since. <clears throat> okay, that's it. No more Christmas cards. All right, so notice that it was accepted then that the plaintiff's lawyer had found himself in a really difficult position. And the amount of blood money in this case, it wasn't huge, it's $15,000. I mean, it's not tiny, but it's not, you know, it's not massive. 
Uh, and yet the decision to seek this money was viewed in so bad a light that it pro provoked a great deal of hostility. Now, there are, there are exceptions to the rule against going after blood money, but I just want to skip over that. You know, it's worth saying that there are times when it, it's viewed as okay to go after blood money, but generally not. Now, so as Baker summarises the general position, insurance systematically shapes tort litigation in a way that goes beyond simply spreading risk. As a result of a century's experience with liability insurance, there is a norm among tort practitioners that tort litigation is supposed to be primarily about collecting insurance money, not blood money. Before liability insurance, all tort suits against individual defence involved real money paid by real people. <coughs> Surely some of that money might have been termed blood money with all the retributive overtones that term suggests, but not all. It is only against the liability insurance norm that tort damages paid by real people are regarded primarily as punishment and only secondarily as compensation. Okay, for our purposes, the crucial point that's contained in this passage is reinforced by Baker's observation that seeking blood money is believed to be vindictive. For the talk theorist, this produces a stark conclusion that we've already seen. Participants in the tort system regard the pursuit of tort's justice as unjust. Uh, in the eyes of tort law practitioners, the morality of tort law is immoral. And I don't think we can just dismiss that as an interesting fact about the tort system that's irrelevant to tort law per se. Now, it may help to think of the matter in, uh, in this way. The corrective justice theorist sees the justice realised in, say, Donahue and Stevenson as part of the story about the law. But, but surely part of the story is that that justice was supposed to actually be realised in the world. But it isn't. So what are we to say about that? Now, it's, um, it's very easy to exaggerate the scope of this criticism, and again, I want to be careful not to do that. No criticism whatsoever has been made about corrective justice as a theory of tort law. I'm still a corrective justice theorist. Um, the observation that the tort system is not a system of corrective justice does nothing to show that corrective justice is not the proper basis upon which to analyse tort law. The criticism is not directed at corrective justice theory per se. That's important. The point is that as an intellect, so this is the point. The point is that as an intellectual project, corrective justice theory cannot remain only a theory of law. It is required to take a stand on and beyond the tort system. Right? We need to think about why it is that we haven't been able to succeed in implementing a system of corrective justice in the world. Now again, it's important to tread carefully. It's perfectly legitimate for individual researchers to restrict themselves to certain questions. So if an individual researcher decides, well, I'm just going to focus myself, my career, I'm just going to focus on analysing tort law, I'm not going to talk about the tort system, fine, that's perfectly fine. I'm no criticism there at all. I'm just saying as a research project, as a whole, corrective justice has to reach further. Okay, now, I just want to finish by talking about some questions that I think this discussion raises um, that we need to think about. Well, there are many questions, but just a few. So, one question is this. What is it about tort law in the modern world that make them incompatible? Well, why can't we realise this system in practice? And at the most abstract level, the answer seems to be that given the shape of the modern world, corrective and distributive justice are themselves incompatible. And Barker's study, Baker's study, sorry, provides evidence for this. The problem, what's the problem? Why don't we go after blood money? Because the costs of injury can be so high that if we pursue those costs, what would otherwise be a valid claim can seem to be an unacceptable act of vindictiveness from which even tort lawyers talk. <laughs> Okay, so acts of corrective justice frequently have consequences that would be so distributively unjust that the feeling is that they can't be countenanced. Now, in this light, it's worth reflecting on how this defeats the general academic presumption that there's a strong connection between being progressive and being plain to friendly. Uh, according to this analysis, that's dead wrong. Uh, being plain to friendly is being vindictive uh, uh, in the eyes of practitioners. We, I think we as academic lawyers need to rethink our position uh, on this. So, and this leads to a second question. What, what does the incompatibility between tort law and the modern world tell us about how those things should be evaluated? And when thinking about this question, I want to, I, I think it's really important to avoid falling into what, what I imagine would be a common error, which is saying basically this, well, if your theory of tort law is inconsistent with the world, that's a problem with your theory. It might be, but it might be a problem with the world. Uh, think about it this way. Uh, if tort law is a system of justice 
and we're unable to realise that system of justice in the world, or we have been unable to, well, maybe that tells us that there's something wrong with the world. <clears throat> okay, and indeed, I think that's true. I think that's actually true. That, that's my personal view. I'm, and that's a subject for another discussion. But I think what we learn from this is that there's something actually wrong with the society in which we live. Because, think about it this way, the notion that a person who wrongs another should make good that wrong, that's a pretty basic moral principle. And yet we seem unable to realise this principle in the world in which we live. Well, that seems to me to tell you there's something wrong with the world in which we live. And in fact, it's got so bad that, as we've seen, the attempt to implement the principle would be viewed by those responsible for implementing the principle as reprehensible. Well, something's gone wrong. Okay, so though it may be analysed differently, I'll spell out the problem this way. Tort law is an attempt to realise norms of interpersonal justice. It lays down standards of conduct that apply as between individuals. Those standards are designed to recognise and acknowledge individuals as moral agents deserving of respect <coughs> as such. As part of this, it stipulates remedial action that must be taken when the standards have been violated. However, as we've seen, we appear unable to implement this system. And that seems to reveal that the modern world is such that it cannot allow us to relate to each other in morally appropriate ways. And in that way, tort law, turn, tort law theory turns into a criticism of the tort system and the wider social context in which this operates. And if that's right, then where, do we, where, do, where can we go with this? Where do we go with this? What can we say about the future of tort law if we can't realise its system of justice in the tort system? Surely we can't continue forever with what's a kind of charade. Uh, we play this, the tort game and we have to play it, I'm not, that's not a criticism, but we play the tort game and we learn about tort law, we play the tort game in court, but the reality is something completely different, some kind of charade. But one way to think about this is to ask, if we could solve the compensation problem, what would, would tort law have to do? Anything? I, most tort lawyers, I think, would say no, but I think that's the wrong answer. And I think that Baker's discoveries help us to see this. You might wonder, in fact I wondered when I read Baker's article, how do plaintiffs feel about the fact, you know, they go along to a lawyer and they say, look, I've suffered $10,000 worth of damage, or whatever it is, say $10,000, and the plaintiff's lawyer says, oh, I'll get you five. <coughs> how do they feel about that? How do they feel that they're not going to get full compensation? How do they feel about the refusal of their lawyers to go after blood money? How do they feel about that? And the, the perhaps surprising answer is that the evidence seems to be that once the issues have been properly explained to them, they're happy. Well, I, when I say happy, I don't mean like they're like, whoa! <laughs> I, but, you know, they're, they're content. They're like, oh, yeah, okay, all right. But they're, they're content. And in part, because they come to see themselves that it would be vindictive for them to go after the blood money. But also, very importantly for our purposes, because they gain a different kind of satisfaction. And we can see this here. So this is another, um, from another interview with a plaintiff's lawyer. In my experience, it is that once having been through that crucible of fire, uh, a trial and its precursors, they accept my advice and they have their day in court. And once they've had their day in court, the bitterness tends to leave. They've been vindicated. Okay. In the presence of alternative mechanisms for ensuring compensation, it's possible then to imagine a tort law in which the concept of vindication was to the fore and compensation was minimised or even forgotten and left to more effective and just means. That would remain a system of tort law consistent with corrective justice and it would, I suggest, be a law that succeeded in furthering the cause of human freedom rather than a law that failed to realise a just system of compensation for incapacity. We've known that it's been a failure in that regard for decades. It would, I submit, be a law that was actually true to itself and the only form of justice that it's equipped to promote. Thank you.